Once again, conflict has erupted in Kerbin's Middle East. A coalition of states friendly to the communist powers have attacked one of their neighbors. This has come as quite a shock as the locals were celebrating Kerbin Day, or as they call it, Yom Kerbin. Neither side is directly allied with the Central Kerbin Alliance Network or the communist powers, but they are very well equipped with their respective friends. So begins the Yom Kerbin War. I am Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. The attackers have launched several MiG-17s. Although these are not the newest fighter jets, they are still very capable. They have also been upgraded to be able to carry heat-seeking missiles. The jets also have three cannons and should be potent in the ground attack role as well. They have gained the element of surprise, and yet the Defender is still able to scramble a couple mirages to meet them in the sky. The Defenders have invested heavily in Central Kerbin Alliance Network technology. The attackers have superior numbers, but how well will they fare against the Defenders' resolve? As the distance closes, both sides arm their missiles and fire. After launching, each side needs to take evasive maneuvers to avoid the incoming missiles. And just like that, two of the attackers' jets are downed for one of the Defenders. The fight is now one-on-one. -on -one. The remaining Mirage has worked its way onto the tail of the last MiG. Its missile has scored a hit, and down goes the last MiG. The Central Kerbin Alliance Network and the Communists will continue to keep an eye on the situation in the region, and provide additional material support for their respective sides. The Central Kerbin Alliance Network has developed some very high-flying, extremely fast reconnaissance aircraft. CCAN has been using these aircraft to spy on communist territory. So communist researchers have been working frantically to come up with an aircraft that can counter these Central Kerbin Alliance Network spy planes. Effectively, this means that they need to develop the world's fastest interceptor. This craft needs to be able to exceed Mach 3 and fly higher than 20,000 meters. This will require pushing the communist technologies to their very limit but the engineers are determined to protect the motherland. They are confident that they will be able to develop an aircraft that will exceed all expectations. Designers carefully place every single piece. To date, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network's Blackbirds have been flying over communist territory with impunity. They have been flying so high and so fast that nothing that the communists have had so far has been able to counter them. Even the best surface-to-air missiles have yet to provide any threat to them. So the goal for this fighter is to be able to fly up and meet them in the air. To do that, the engineers have put on some of the most powerful engines developed. But the engines will be going through massive amounts of fuel, so much of the internals of this aircraft are going to be devoted to fuel storage. With much of the aircraft development complete, it's time for a few of the final steps, including in the installing of the landing gear, and the weapons components. No weapons will be equipped for the first test flight. However, all the necessary hard parts are being installed. A few minor tweaks are being made to the main wing in order to adjust its center of aerodynamic pressure. And with that, Yuri Kerman is excited to take out the MiG-25 on its first test flight. He's going to attempt to fly higher than 35,000 meters and achieve Mach 4 in this test flight. Yuri runs through the pre-flight checks, throttles up, and screams down the runway. With the powerful engines, Yuri is able to quickly climb over 5,000 meters. For his speed run, Yuri is hoping to achieve an altitude over 14,000 meters. The cooler, less dense upper atmosphere should be a safer place to make his speed run. But even still, he will be pushing the plane to its absolute limit. Around 15,000 meters, Yuri levels the plane off and prepares to go full throttle. He opens up and quickly accelerates to Mach 3, and yet the plane is still accelerating. Will he achieve Mach 4? He is just able to do that and quickly has to throttle down, but even still, the aircraft has overheat a little bit and he has lost one of his vertical stabilizers. But Yuri is still determined is going to attempt to achieve an altitude higher than 35,000 meters even though his plane is slightly damaged. 
As he accelerates, he gently pulls back on the stick. The plane manages to continue to accelerate even though it is pitched up. At 20,000 meters, it's no longer able to accelerate, but it is still climbing. And with that, Yuri has easily surpassed 35,000 meters in his jet. This should deter those sea can spy planes. It has also come to the attention of the communists that the Central Kerbin Alliance Network has developed a vertical takeoff and landing capable fighter. Not to be outdone, the communists are highlighting their Yak 38. A notable difference are the two engines tucked inside the front of the aircraft just behind the cockpit. This aircraft should be a big help to the communist navy. A VTOL is a much simpler way to land and take off from a ship rather than trying to worry about arresting wires, ramps, and catapults. This aircraft should help the communist better challenge the Central Kremlin Alliance network at sea. As Yuri approaches the runway, he switches the engines back around to land vertically. In order to transition between horizontal flight and vertical flight, the rear nozzles are able to rotate. The thrust of the front engines and the angle of the rear engines are bound together. Thus, the plane is able to easily transition between horizontal and vertical flights. The Communist Intelligence report that the Central Criminal Alliance Network has discovered something strange on Duna, some kind of odd signal. It just so happens that a trip to Duna was planned anyway, but now they have a new location to land. For missions out to Duna, the powerful N-1 rocket has been developed. Hopefully, everything with this mission goes well, as previous tests with this rocket didn't go entirely as planned. But the Communist Space Agency is confident that everything will work this time. At the appropriate time, a transfer out to Duna is plotted. To date, none of the Communist missions out to Duna have been successful. But this time, famed Kerbalnaut pilot Yuri Kerman is on board. His skill as a pilot is rivaled only by Central Kerbin Alliance Network pilot Jebediah Kerman. The ejection burn has been well timed as the craft will easily get an encounter with Duna's sphere of influence. From this point, only a few small maneuvers will be needed in order to have the craft aero break into orbit around Duna. The strayed signal is coming from somewhere near the South Pole, so the craft will aero break into a polar orbit. Once the crew gets into their designated orbit, they will merely need to wait for Duna to rotate underneath them for them to line up with their landing site. During previous missions to the MUN, the Communists were able to discover some strange technology that was presumably developed by the Fascists. Unfortunately, the technology was not overly well understood, and everything that the Communists were able to reverse engineer, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network destroyed. So Yuri and the crew are hoping that the discoveries here will be even more valuable than what was found on the Mun. Perhaps what they find on Duna will finally unlock the secrets to the Kraken Drive. Or perhaps some other technology unimagined is yet to be discovered. The craft now enters Duna's atmosphere and begins slowing down to capture into orbit. The solar panels are retracted to avoid damage. Duna's thin, cool atmosphere is ideal for aerobraking. The Delta V budget for the mission is a little tight, so any savings can be a big help. The air braking has been successful. Now Yuri plots a maneuver at his apoapsis to raise his periapsis so he won't re-enter the atmosphere again. Once the craft reaches a stable orbit, the crew will then wait for their landing site to rotate underneath them. The scientist is able to use this time to conduct a few experiments while they wait. The crew wonders what is the source of the signal coming from Duna's South Pole. From orbit, it's hard to get a good idea of what the area is like. The region seems to be kind of hilly. Perhaps the signal is coming from one of the hills. With the location now in line with their orbit, Yuri plots his landing burn. This communist landing craft will not be very controllable in the atmosphere, so Yuri must plot his landing burn very precisely. Communist engineers have seen the shuttles developed by the Central Kerbin Alliance Network and think that they should be developing their own as well, but for now, they're using the tried and true capsule design. Yuri points the craft retrograde and will be using the last bit of fuel from his third stage to help the craft slow down as it comes in for a landing. 
and once again the solar panels are retracted to keep them safe as they enter the atmosphere. It looks like the landing is going to be close, but they may be a few kilometers off, but that should be close enough for a little walk. A hardy communist Kerbal isn't afraid of a little exercise. The parachute is deployed to help the craft slow down a little bit, and then the engines are used to slow down the final 30 meters per second. The terrain is a little hilly, and apparently the craft didn't land in the most ideal way. But Yuri is able to plant the flag, and everything is still intact. And with that, Boris Kerman heads towards the signal. Using his jetpack, it really only took a couple minutes to get there. As he approaches, his radio picks up the signal. Boris carefully records what he's hearing. The site is kind of shaped like a pyramid, although that may just be the way the hills are shaped. The signal seems to be repeating itself. Boris spends a little bit more time investigating the site, then decides it's time to head back to the pod. He will take his findings back to Kerbin, where hopefully scientists and engineers can decipher the signal. It seems clear that someone or something, is trying to say something. Boris is able to get back into the pod. Yuri thinks he can use this hill as kind of like a ramp and launch the craft up that way. He is counting on the craft being of robust communist design, and it is. By launching at the appropriate time into a polar orbit, Yuri is able to get the craft lined up for its ejection burn back to Kerbin. If Yuri didn't properly time this burn, the craft would not have enough Delta V to make it back home. Once in orbit, Yuri will need to plot a prograde burn over Duna's North Pole, and that should eject from the Duna system and get them on course to Kerbin. There should then be enough Delta V left for some small course corrections, but not much more than that. It looks like Ike is in just the right place to get a little bit of a gravity assist off of it. As the crew prepares to leave the Duna system, they also discuss what it is that Boris found on the surface. Could this be something from the fascists? Or is this some kind of elaborate hoax put on by the Central Kerbin Alliance Network to get the communists to waste money? Or is it something else entirely? What could be the source and origin of that signal? After the ejection burn, Yuri plots a mid-course correction burn to set the craft on course to do an aero capture around Kerbin. As with Duna, Yuri is attempting to do an aero capture around Kerbin and then plot his landing burn so that he can land in communist territory. Kerbin's atmosphere is much thicker and warmer than Duna's, so the craft heats up a lot more coming back from Duna. After the initial aero capture, Yuri burns his engine one last time to land just a little closer to the communist space center. And with that, the crew is looking forward to being back on Kerbin again. However, what exactly did they find on Duna? What implications will that have for the Cold War? Hopefully scientists will be able to decipher the signal quickly. Then the communists can best plot their next course of action. I am Echo 3, and thanks for joining me on this discussion about the Cold War. I will see you next time.